Okay, so today we're going to describe uh, more of the Industrial Revolution. And in particular, though, we're going to consider what the meaning of the Industrial Revolution is. And so in part, I'm going to give you some details here because I'm going to matter about interpreting what actually is the meaning of the Industrial Revolution. And the classic kind of core of the Industrial Revolution, as I say, are very dramatic changes in five major industries. Uh, textiles turns out to be the most important. And it's a case where we can actually track down the people who initiated this revolution and who effectively uh, changed the world. And last time I, I described, I'm going to uh, actually not put it up again because we'll need the space. Last time I described uh, John Kay and the flying shuttle, and then Wyatt and Paul and their attempt uh, to mechanize spinning, which ended in bankruptcy and ruin. Uh, the next uh, major inventor in the Industrial Revolution period is a guy called Hargreaves, uh, 1769, and the device is the spinning jenny. And this was, again, just a simple wood and metal machine, but one that replicated the action of hand spinning. And so spinning was a, a major occupation for women in the pre-industrial economy because it took so long to spin a pound of thread. Uh, and so that's where we even get the terms like spinster, because uh, that's how single women would support themselves in this uh, early uh, economy. So it was a major operation, and it was largely, uh, um, uh, it could be done by hand purely, or it could be done by the spinning wheel which was a medieval uh, European innovation. Uh, but there was still this limit of one thread per spinner. And what Hargreaves' spinning machine did was to do that on a multiple scale. It was to take that action of hand spinning and instead of one thread, have 16. Uh, and that's already a huge amplification in uh, productivity. But it was actually a hand machine which was designed for use in people's cottages. Eventually, they had these machines that had something like 100 threads each. Right? But again, if you think about the amplification of productivity, it's just enormous. Uh, and so this device, that's why it was so revolutionary in the spinning industry. Right from the beginning, it was going to dramatically reduce the cost of yarn in the textile industry. Um, again, as I say, it's a, a machine that would be very difficult to make money from because just like the flying shuttle, it was something that was used in people's homes, could be reproduced by any competent uh, craftsman, watchmaker, blacksmith, uh, and would be impossible to enforce the patent rights. What actually happened with Hargreaves is that it took him, again, it always takes a while to develop these machines. He was actually forced to flee from Lancashire by machine breakers in 1768. Uh, he then attempted to patent the machine, 1769, but his patent application was denied because British patent law was very demanding and peculiar in this period. And one thing is you could not have sold the machine to anyone before you applied for the patent. So anyone who was ignorant of patent procedures, if you just happened to have sold the machine to someone else, that invalidated all potential patent applications. So you had to be quite sophisticated to, to use this system. Uh, and anyway, even if he'd got a patent, it's not clear that he would have made any money. And he died in poverty. Uh, he died in obscurity in the workhouse in uh, 1777. But he is actually one of the great creators of uh, the modern world, right? And that machine uh, immediately had dramatic impact on the costs of producing uh, cotton textiles in the Lancashire industry. And in the same year, another innovator called Arkwright introduced a machine called the water frame and again, these dates are always somewhat arbitrary because these machines don't just drop onto the earth in one particular d day. 
they actually take a while to develop, and so we give it roughly date. But the interesting thing is it's almost exactly the same year. And that's why if, if some people you want to date the Industrial Revolution, uh, it's the 1760s, or 1769 would be one of the, uh, the best dates for this. Uh, and uh, Arkwright uh, actually was the first of these innovators to actually make a lot of money. Uh, what actually happened in his case was that he did successfully patent the machine. He was a much more sophisticated guy. Now, there's a lot of mystery about Arkwright's role in the Industrial Revolution because his background was actually as a barber, wig maker, and dealer in hair. Right? And somehow, this guy came up with the technical ability. And the water frame, what it actually consists of is another way of spinning cotton thread. It's a machine that's designed for use in factories, and it's called the water frame because it was initially powered by water. And it was actually the perfection of the earlier Lewis and Paul machine. And it uses rollers for spinning, so it's very different from the spinning jenny. It turns out that this machine could make very good fine quality yarn that you need for the weft in weaving cloth. And this machine can make the strong yarn that you need for the warp. And so in the same year, both of those types of thread production were actually dramatically changed. This one was, became the foundation then for a factory industry in textiles. It was actually designed already for use in factories. Uh, Arkwright, as I say, somehow came up with this. There then followed some patent litigation against him, which was promoted by cotton manufacturers and factories who didn't want to honor his patents. And they got a mechanic that he had worked with to claim that it, the machine was, in fact, his. <laughs> and that Arkwright had actually stolen the device from him. We'll never know the exact uh, truths of this. Uh, Arkwright's patents were then invalidated by the courts in 1785. And so he had somewhat limited uh, patent protection. He developed other machines as well as the water frame that also deal with the process of, of going from the raw cotton to the cotton yarn. Uh, but he died in 1792 with a large fortune a lot of that was made by his abilities, actually, as an entrepreneur and organizer of this new factory system. And so the interesting thing is that he's the first of these guys to actually really make money. But it's not clear exactly how much of his money came from the protection of property rights in England, as opposed to the fact that he was a very good businessman and a very good organizer of these new factories. And he made a lot of money once he st had no patents. Right After 1785, he made still substantial sums of money. And so he is uh, a famous figure then of uh, this revolution. And then, very soon after, uh, Samuel Crompton in 1779 produced a device called the mule. And it's called the mule because it's a combination of these two other machines. And that actually became the basis for the spinning industry in 19th century Britain. It could produce, on a factory basis, very high quality threads. Right? Initially, it's still manually operated, but eventually the thing was mechanized completely. Uh, and so it became a very important uh, uh, machine. Um, uh, what happened to him uh, died in poverty. <laughs> uh, Crompton, uh, once he produced the machine, started producing this very uh, fine thread. Uh, the locals in uh, his uh, town of Bolton, which became a center of the spinning industry in, in Britain, um, immediately saw that something was going on. There was a lot of curiosity about this machine. And he decided uh, that he would give the machine to the town, to the local industry. Uh, in return from a promise that the manufacturers would raise money to give him a prize, a reward. He would not actually try and patent the machine. They defaulted on their promise. Uh, he was eventually given about 500 pounds by subscription of manufacturers in the 1790s. That's about 10 times a carpenter's, sorry, 20 times a carpenter's wage. Right? And this actually became, as I say, the foundation of the spinning industry in Britain. Uh, and Eventually, in 1811, uh, Parliament gave him a grant of uh, 5,000 uh, pounds. He, as I say, these people were responsible for increasing the output of the British economy by something like 30 or 40 percent. 
right, over the course of the Industrial Revolution period. So relative to the economic gains that came from their activity, uh, the rewards that they got were pretty small. And the interesting thing here was that that reward, again, had to come through the political process. Right? The patent system, so the interesting thing is, if the Industrial Revolution is really triggered by institutions, the interesting thing is that you see here that the institutions in Britain are actually very poor at rewarding innovation still in this period. Most of these guys don't manage to make anything uh, from these innovations. They did get one thing, though, that's interesting is that we know their names. They became famous, right? And that's actually, it, it leads to one other kind of interesting speculation about the Industrial Revolution, which is that most medieval innovators, we don't know who did it. We don't know who invented the spinning wheel, <laughs> right? Uh, there's lots of things like spectacles in, in medieval uh, Italy. We just don't know who these people are. What's interesting about this society is that these people became famous, right? They, be, they were, in some ways, minor rock stars of their time. Uh, and so that even though they couldn't get money, they got fame. And one question was, is, was the Industrial Revolution just the result of a particular type of culture in Britain in this period, a culture which delighted in innovation, and which was just a cultural accident that the ancient Greeks thought that this was unimportant, trivial, why would anyone be interested in that? But the British, and particularly people in North Britain in this period, were fascinated by the possibilities of these machines and, and would have, even without any reward, people would have done it for fun. It's like the, the software community now that writes programs like Linux, right? That they just, they want to do it, right? And so it, it's kind of an interesting issue here. Uh, what else happens then in the industry? Um, next innovator in the act is a guy called the Reverend Edmund Cartwright, who's a vicar. He's a priest in the Church of England in one of these textile towns in the north of England. And his innovation is to introduce a power loom. And that came in in 1785. And what prompted that was he set out inventing a power loom without ever having seen someone weaving. He had no mechanical background. He's trained in mathematics and classics. Uh, but he was vicar in one of these textile towns. And the revolution in spinning here had dramatically reduced the cost of thread. And so it had created a bottleneck in the weaving industry. And this was the period when weavers became enormously wealthy. Because cloth was much cheaper now. There's a lot of demand for this cloth. But it takes a while to train good weavers. And uh, their uh, salaries rose accordingly. And his parishioners were complaining about this bottleneck in the industry. And so Cartwright said, well, someone should invent a power loom. Why not me? Uh, and he actually devised the, pretty much the principles of the power loom. Uh, he patented the machine. But again, as a kind of a, a classic of the industry in this period, the original power loom wasn't that good. Right? It had the ideas, but it needed a lot of development. And so during the life of the patent, the machine was a commercial failure. They set up a factory in Manchester that was destroyed by machine breakers. Uh, and uh, he made actually no money uh, from the patent. But he got a grant from Parliament. And his grant was 10,000 pounds. So he actually did quite well in this period. It's interesting that uh, Crompton got a grant of only 5,000 pounds. Cartwright got more because he was socially more upper class. He had better political connections. And he actually got his grant uh, before uh, uh, Crompton, who got his in 1811. Uh, and so what's interesting still is that innovation here is really still heavily dependent on government favor, right? And it's just you can go and appeal to parliament and say, look what I did for the country. I deserve some kind of reward for this. Uh, but what's interesting about him, as I say, is that here's a guy who essentially just got together with the village blacksmith and carpenter, stuff like that, and said, here, how are we going to do this? And it does raise this puzzle about the Industrial Revolution, which is if he could make a major innovation in the Industrial Revolution period, 
why couldn't people do that a thousand years before or two thousand years before? Right? It's not that these guys have any particular talent or particular genius. It just seems like now in this period, everyone's interested in making these innovations. And they just assume that, hey, we could do something, right? Uh, I mean, it would be like uh, one of us deciding today, oh, I'm, I'm going to revolutionize the American auto industry. Where do I start? I'll go see my local mechanic and see uh, what kind of machine we need to introduce in this period. Okay? Uh, so Crompton com uh, sorry, Cartwright comes in. And then uh, the last of the kind of great heroic industrial revolution innovators is a guy, uh, Richard Roberts. And his device is the self-acting mule. Uh, that's actually introduced in 1830. Um, and what happened to uh, Roberts? Um, poverty. <laughs> um, what happened in his case was that by now, the industry is mature enough that professional machine developers appear. And so Roberts is one of the first great professional engineers in the industry. But typically, developing these machines now costs a lot of money. And initially, they're not that good. And so in the life of your patent, initially, it's hard to make money off these things because it's not like, say, modern drugs where on day one of the patent, the, th the stuff is fully effective, right? The, the typically, one of these machines is it works a little bit better than the existing stuff, and it's going to get a lot better as people have experience with it, but it's not initially going to be particularly profitable. And so what happened with him is the development costs for this machine were 12,000 uh, pounds. Over the first nine years of the patent, so the patent would run 17 years in Britain, uh, he made only 7,000 pounds in revenues. And so he was well past halfway through the patent without even having recovered the development costs of this machine, even though it became, again, a major machine in the industry and a very important uh, machine. Uh, and so what happened to happen then is that Parliament extended his patent by seven years to try and give him some more reward. Uh, he was not a very good manager of money. He died in poverty in 1864. And his daughter then was granted a pension of 300 pounds a year by Parliament in recognition of his services to the country. And so the interesting thing about the industry is, as I say, uh, one of the important features here, it's a lot of tinkerers, small-scale mechanics, until this later period here when it becomes a professional industry. Uh, the institutional rewards for innovation turn out to be very poor in the industry in this period. These are actually the original innovators. Uh, all of these machines have to be incredibly and extensively developed by people who are actually using them in factories. We have the records of some of those cotton manufacturers. And the interesting thing is that even though they're dramatically improving the productivity of these machines over time, by at a rate of uh, something like 2 to 3% per year, which is an unheard of sustained productivity advance in this world, uh, they make the normal rate of return on capital. They make about a 10% rate of return per year. The old-fashioned sector of the industry, such as handloom weaving, the, the, the guys who organize that, they make about 10% as well. Grocers make about 10% in Britain in this period. And so what's interesting is that there's a huge amount of innovation going on, but the, but the major beneficiary of all of this uh, innovation is actually the consumer. Because these firms are competing with each other. They're producing a very standardized commodity. This is not Coca-Cola. right? This is number 20 cotton yarn. Uh, and in that competition, what happens is if one of them figures out a way of doing it more cheaply, the next door firm pretty soon catches on, finds out how that's done. They just drive down output prices steadily and steadily. And so uh, over the period of the Industrial Revolution, they increased the productivity of cotton textile production by something like 25-fold. You could get 25 times as much output per unit of input over the 100 years of the Industrial Revolution. And it turns out that uh, cotton textiles, as I say, explains the majority, not cotton, but cotton textiles, and then the extension to wool and linen and the other textile industries. In sum, it explains the majority of the growth of the British economy in this period. Um, the puzzle then it creates is, that since it's this kind of sudden burst of innovation, is 
what's the meaning of the Industrial Revolution? Because as I say, the suddenness of this seems to say, look, something happened in 1769, right? Except that if you know anything about British history, nothing is happening in England in 1769. It's an incremental change is going on in the social system, the political system. It's a very flat period, right? You're not going to be able to find any kind of key precipitating event. And so the question that comes up is, well, why is this a really a sudden break in the nature of the economy? Or can this be regarded as just a continuation of earlier kind of technological advances that were being made over the past uh, 600 or 700 years? And the important thing about uh, uh, productivity growth in the economy as a whole is that the growth of efficiency in the economy as a whole is going to be the sum of the growth of efficiency in each industry in the economy multiplied by the share of value added in that industry in the economy as a whole. Okay? And so efficiency growth actually has this very nice property, again, at the national level, which is that it's actually, that's why it's possible to say how much did each industry contribute to the overall efficiency growth of the economy in this period. It's because it actually sums up nicely in this way. Now, what that implies then is that the effect of innovation in any area in the economy is going to very heavily depend on what share of output is actually being uh, produced in that sector of the economy. If you have a dramatic innovation in an industry which there's very little consumer demand for, then it can't affect very much the overall uh, productivity growth of the economy. What's important about cotton textiles in this period is that as clothing gets cheaper, there's a huge demand for clothing. Just before coming to the lecture today, I, I, and believe me, I'm, I'm a person who does not spend a lot on clothing, as you'll have noticed. Um, I was just looking in my wardrobe and thinking, how could I have so much clothing, right? Most of this I'll never wear again, right? We, never, we can't wear out clothing now. We, we get become tired of it long beforehand. And so we have an incredible demand. I mean, basically, in the pre-industrial period, people had one or two suits of clothing per year. We could still do that, right? Two sets of clothing would be enough, right? Uh, but because of fashion and because of style, once clothing gets cheap, there's this enormous demand for clothing. And Americans are simply unable now to wear out clothing. What happens to it? It's sent to Goodwill. Most of that stuff can't be resold again in the market. You can go to Goodwill and buy pretty good clothing for almost nothing. Right? Most of it now is actually shipped to Africa or to other third world countries. They just bail it up. Uh, that in the heart of the Congo, people are dressed in your hand-me-downs. Right? Uh, and, and that happened very soon after the Industrial Revolution, which was as clothing got very cheap, clothing styles exploded. People began to wear more and more clothing. They would wear clothing which would never actually wear out before the end. And what happened then was there were two possibilities here. One was that this device, you know, clothing would become incredibly cheap and people would simply say, no, well, now I can just spend 1% of my income on clothing. That didn't happen. The share of income devoted to clothing expenditures remained at 10 or 15%. Right? And so this remained a significant share of the economy. And so this productivity growth then could feed into the growth of output in the economy, partly just because of this accident of demand. There were other innovations made in the previous 700 years which were as dramatic as those in cotton textiles. The classic one was the invention of the printing press in the 15th century. If you look at the price of books over the first 150 or 200 years after the introduction of the printing press, those prices fell as much as cotton cloth prices fell in the Industrial Revolution period. There's again about a 20-fold expansion of the productivity of the production of printed materials. Why didn't, that has almost no measurable impact on the productivity on, and output of the economy in pre-industrial Europe. Why is that? It's because book production is tiny. And once books get cheaper, the amount that's produced increases, but it still remains a tiny fraction of economic output. But that's an accident of the demands of people. 
right? So for example, if the population of Europe in the 15th century had largely consisted of university professors who consumed a large amount of printed material, then in that economy, the revolution in the printing press would actually have had dramatic effects on output. It would actually have dramatically changed the measured output of the economy, but because most people are illiterate still in this period, and again because uh, there isn't a lot to read. I mean, there's just not been a lot of production of material that people want to read. It's not now like when you have Oprah magazine. That had not yet been developed as a lifestyle choice in this economy. And so that's a kind of an accidental feature then of the Industrial Revolution, which is, is it just that you finally, you'd had these productivity advances in the past, but what was important now was that you had an advance in an industry where there was this potentially huge consumer demand. That's one factor. A second accidental factor here is that another thing that would have rapidly choked off growth in the textile industry would have been supplies of raw cotton. Cotton uh, was very expensive in running into the Industrial Revolution period. Raw cotton prices actually also fell very substantially in the Industrial Revolution period. It's not counted as a productivity advance in the British economy because it's all being done externally. But that was a crucial factor in allowing this industry to remain as big as it was. If raw cotton had remained at, at, at the original price so that in 18 50s, it was three times as expensive as it then was, the size of the cotton textile industry would have been much, much lower. Uh, most of the cost of, of, or half the cost of cotton goods in the end was the, the raw cotton in the goods. And that would actually have reduced the amount of productivity growth in, in England. And so an important contributing factor was actually developments going on in the Americas. And in particular, the, in the slave system in the southern United States, and also the productivity improvements that were being made in the cultivation of cotton. Right? And so again, that, as I say, it's a kind of accidental factor. Uh, it depended on you know, the discovery of the Americas, the development of the US South, but it's important in actually creating growth in Britain in this period. A third factor that also turns out to be very important is that you know, another industry that could have been revolutionized in this period was, say, brick production. Bricks are very heavy. They tend to be produced very close to where they're used. And that would have limited demand in this industry to just domestic demand. Another key feature of cotton textiles is that it's very light in relation to its weight. Even in the 18th century, you can ship cotton textiles a long way and not add that much to the price. And so the, the other factor that made the industry huge in Britain was that very quickly, the majority of the output of the industry was actually being exported. And uh, it was important that Britain had, was winning this war for supremacy on the seas because that's what gave access to Britain to very large numbers of international markets. And so it turns out there's a kind of interesting alliance between the technological advance here, which created a demand for overseas markets, and the extension of British uh, political power in this period and military power, which actually opened up these markets. And in particular, for example, India became a huge market for British textile goods. China became an enormous market for British textile goods. If both of these countries had controlled their own political destiny, they would have excluded British imports. That would have actually reduced the share of output in Britain that was coming from textiles. It would have reduced the productivity growth of the economy in the Industrial Revolution period. And so you have actually this interesting alliance of the nature of demand, the price elasticity of demand, uh, the um, uh, supplies of raw material that are crucial for the industry. And the third thing is the uh, ability of the British to keep open overseas markets for these goods. There's a fourth factor which also enters in this period as well. And that fourth factor is the British population started to grow very strongly in the 1760s. And over the course of the Industrial Revolution, British population roughly tripled. Britain by then, all the land was completely occupied. Uh, there was no ability to produce food to feed all of these people. 
that meant that Britain had to export large quantities of manufactured goods in order to import food from countries like Ireland or from eventually the United States, and to import also, very importantly, raw materials from the Baltic. And so again, that meant that uh, uh, exchange rates were going to be such as to favor the exports of manufactured goods. And so it's actually, as I say, there's a lot of things that had to kind of come together in Britain in the 1760s to produce such a huge growth of productivity from this one particular industry. And so it raises this kind of puzzle about what extent was this really an accident as opposed to any kind of dramatic or systematic change in the economy. Another factor that you actually have to consider is the following. And here we need a little bit of geography. So here's England stuck on the edge of Europe here. Here's the continent down here. Okay, and then the Baltic. Uh, okay. Uh, now, the productivity growth of the British economy moved from roughly 0.1% to about 0.5% per year in the Industrial Revolution period. That's a pretty dramatic change. And as I say, it's not modern productivity growth rates yet in the Industrial Revolution, but it's a dramatic change from what occurred in the pre-industrial world. But that's measuring productivity at the level of the British economy. Um, if you were to measure productivity growth at the level of Europe as a whole in the Industrial Revolution period, it would be very significantly lower. One of the reasons that productivity growth is so high in Britain is that cotton goods are being manufactured here and then exported to the rest of Europe. Okay? So that when you measure the productivity growth in those economies, you wouldn't count cotton textiles. It's not a product of those economies. Right? So that if you looked at Europe as a whole, if you, if you expanded, this is just an arbitrary political boundary that we're using to measure productivity growth. Suppose I think of Britain as, as we shouldn't take it in isolation. It's part of a system of trading economies in Europe. Production of any good will tend to concentrate on a particular location. Right? Once these innovations were made in Britain, they could have been exported and the production could have occurred elsewhere. Production remained in Britain in part because the British were very good at organizing factories. Right? And so that how we measure that productivity, it's going to be influenced very strongly by where we draw the boundaries. So for example, even though productivity growth tends to be measured at the English level, Ireland in this period is politically united with England. If we include Ireland in the calculation, right? because a lot of these goods are being exported to Ireland, uh, what would actually happen is you would reduce measured productivity growth rates in the English economy in this period, down from 0.5 to 0.4 or 0.35, right? But then again, the question is, well, why should we just include you know, Ireland or Scotland? What about France? What about Germany, right? Where do you want to draw the boundaries? Now, it's hard to convey in a short time you know, the, imp the importance of that issue, but another way to think about this is most of the cotton industry was concentrated in this tiny area here in Lancashire, where a very large fraction of the population is engaged in, in cotton textile production. If we instead said, well, look, I don't think we should think about the Industrial Revolution as a British affair. I think we should think about it more as an affair of this small area in the northwest of England. We can again measure productivity growth for the county of Lancashire or for the, for the northwest of England. In that case, the productivity growth rate in that area would be something like 1.5% per year in the Industrial Revolution period. You would get this incredibly sharp break from the pre-industrial world because the more you focus on where these goods are being produced, then the more dramatic is the uh, productivity growth within the uh, economy. But as I say, it's not at all obvious what the appropriate level of analysis is. Is it where the industry happens to locate? Right? Suppose it had happened to locate in the Netherlands after the Industrial Revolution. Would you then have said, well, that's where all of the productivity advances and that's where the Industrial Revolution occurred? Because a lot of this is just about the fact that it was still cost efficient to actually have these mills uh, in Lancashire in this particular area. And so there's an argument that can be made, look, 
Europe as a whole was likely to experience various productivity advances. Industries tend to concentrate once they have an advance. What happened was the British happened to make some of these important early innovations. They got ahead in this industry. They captured the industry. That's where it located. But there were, you know, we should think about Europe as a whole as being the place where this could have likely happened. And the reason why that's not a, a crazy speculation is that in France, in exactly the same period as the revolution in textiles in Britain, uh, the French actually introduced a textile device that was more sophisticated and more innovative in many ways than anything that the British introduced in this period. And that was the Jacquard loom. It took them roughly 78 years of work on this to finally perfect it. Right? The first idea for the Jacquard loom came in 1725. It was finally produced in perfected form in 1803 by Jacquard. Right? And what does the Jacquard loom uh, do? Let me just create some space here. So what the Jacquard loom does is there's different types of weaving, right? And remember, in all weaving, you've got your warp here, and then you've got to insert the weft. Now, if you produce gray cloth, you know, if you produce cloth, there's a lot of demand for patterned and colored cloth. And there's different ways of doing that. The cheapest way is just to produce the, the gray cloth and then bleach it and then dye it after you produce it. But there's a much more sophisticated way of producing materials where you color the threads before you assemble them. And then you interweave them to form various patterns. And so various people here I see are wearing, some of them are wearing shirts that are done in that way. Okay? And it turns out that when you interweave these threads to form these patterns, you can in fact put the picture of Mona Lisa <laughs> on cloth if you want to <laughs> just by the appropriate choices of thread. And so there was a, a market, there was a demand in this period for these very fancy, elaborately patterned colored cloths, right? And if you go to India now, for example, saris are often produced in this way with very elaborate patterns. They're actually from the thread, and it's just the interweaving of the thread. And so if you insert, now we insert blue, and now we insert, and we insert it under the, or over the other threads in particular ways, you can do almost anything, right? You can make any picture you want, and you can make any face you want. Obama's face could be produced in this type of weaving and put on these uh, cloths, right? It turns out this was an area of the industry that the French were much more involved in than the British, and in particular because the France had a much larger market for very high quality uh, cloth for luxury goods, right? in part due to the nature of the French court, the French uh, upper classes. Um, producing these cloths was incredibly uh, elaborate and time consuming because the way that they were actually produced is that you have to tie off the various threads here into a, bun into a string and that lifts up a set of the warp threads, and then you insert the weft, and then you would have another set of them tied off in another pattern. And so you would have, at the side of the loom here, hundreds of these different draw cords that you would have to pull in the right sequence in order to get the weft inserted correctly to produce this elaborate pattern that you're trying to produce. And so it was very time consuming, it's very skilled, uh, it takes a lot of work, it is very expensive. What was the idea of the Jacquard loom? The idea of the loom was to automate that process. And what the Jacquard loom actually introduced was the punch card that was later used for computers. And so in the Jacquard loom, these cards had a hole corresponding to each of the threads in the cloth. And those holes could either be left filled or they could be punched out. And then there was a device put on top of the loom where these cards ran through in sequence. And each line there corresponds to a set of instructions in terms of which of these threads to pull up. Because there were needles that would come through. If they went through, it would lift the thread. If they didn't, the thread would stay down. Right? And so the threads are kind of attached, each to a string, and then they can be pulled up or down depending on the instructions here. Right? And so what's amazing about the Jacquard loom is that conceptually, it's a dramatic break, right? 
to think about how could we, it, you know, you have to kind of twist and think, well, how do we go from all these strings to an automatic coding of this pattern, right? And once you've done it then, a, a, a cloth designer can design the cloth, craftsmen then or carpenters can carve out these patterns, and the relatively unskilled weavers can run them uh, through the machine. Right? This actually became, as I say, foundation of a whole other branch of the textile industry. And silk weaving in India now is very important in producing the, the cloth for that market. Um, it's just as dramatic as anything in Britain. It turns out to have very limited impacts in terms of the productivity of French industry. And the reason is that this is still very expensive and very high demand cloth. There isn't a huge market for it. It's just a function of the relative sizes of these markets. And so an argument could be made, the French were just unlucky. <laughs> they were smart. It turns out the French did a whole bunch of other innovations in the Industrial Revolution period that turned out to not have a huge uh, impact. Another one was the balloon was invented in this period. The first parachute jump was made by the French from a balloon. Uh, they invented uh, fruit preserving. They did a bunch of stuff at the same time as the, as the British were doing things. It just turns out that by accident, they, they were not very good. They, they were producing lots of concords in the Industrial Revolution period. That is, innovative designs that really didn't turn out to have a huge market. And so again, the idea comes up, well, look, there were a bunch of countries competing here in the Industrial Revolution period. Could it just be accidental? that the British uh, were the ones who made the innovations that then had these very profound impacts. And so shouldn't we consider the Industrial Revolution more as a European phenomena? And as a European phenomena, it represents a much less dramatic break from the past than the Industrial Revolution where you concentrate on the north of England. And so it becomes possible to think of Europe as having uh, had a gradually increasing rate of innovation going into this period, and then various accidental events in Britain in the Industrial Revolution period had this magnifying effect. And it was that kind of combination of British military power, British population growth occurring at the same time, Britain's inability to feed itself, and the introduction of these new techniques, which then kind of propelled this country forward and gave a, a mistaken impression that this was kind of on 1769, suddenly that's the, the year the world changed, right? And we'll never actually know exactly when that change came from earlier society to later society. The Industrial Revolution is potentially a much more drawn out affair uh, where luck and accident and geography, uh, all of these things uh, play some role in the process. Okay, so uh, next time, I will say just a little bit more about the other innovations, just on the same line here, and then go on and talk about the consequences of the Industrial Revolution.